Hello and welcome to the Falcon Review Step 1 Review Course. Today we'll be covering bleeding disorders. We'll start with a discussion of normal hemostasis, continue on with a discussion of uh, bleeding disorders and thrombocytopenia, and close with uh, platelet dysfunction and thrombotic disorders. So let's begin with a discussion of normal hemostasis. Clotting is something that occurs in us every day. Uh, it is a, a normal process to help uh, repair uh, microvascular injury and macrovascular injury. And uh, we have primary and secondary hemostasis. The process of normal hemostasis involves both platelet adhesion as well as a protein cascade to generate the formation of a stable fibrin clot. So clots normally form at the site of an area of endothelial injury and uh, the exposed collagen at that injured site is bound by von Willebrand factor, which binds platelets via the glycoprotein 1B receptor. Here's a graphic representation of uh, the endothelial cell. Uh, you can see that the, the normal uh, contiguous membranes of the endothelial cells are disrupted, exposing uh, some free collagen underneath, which exposes the von Willebrand factor to the platelets, which are seen as the uh, brownish blobs floating through there in the uh, otherwise uh, red cell matrix. So these bound platelets are activated, uh, stimulated to uh, release procoagulants including thromboxane A2, which causes further platelet aggregation as well as vasoconstriction. These platelets serve as a glycoprotein membrane to uh, generate uh, and activate the rest of the uh, protein cascade, and these platelets also uh, serve as a binding site for these fibrin multimers uh, via the GP2B3A system, and they aggregate. So these platelets then can contract once this stable network of other platelets and the fibrin network is formed and can form a stable clot, thus ensuring hemostasis. So again, to follow up the graphic representation we started earlier, the star-shaped cells are now the activated platelets. And you can see they are cross-linked and adhered to one another uh, via fibrinogen uh, as well as the glycoprotein 2B3A system. So this platelet plug is further cross-linked with the fibrin, uh, and that's going to form your stable clot. Coagulation itself uh, is initiated by a tissue factor, which is released from the damaged endothelium. And it initiates a proteolytic cascade. Uh, that leads to the production of the fibrin polymers that will bind to the platelets in the picture previously seen and will further strengthen the clot. So here's uh, the well-known uh, graphic representation of the coagulation cascade. And uh, the initiation of uh, the coagulation cascade starts at the top of the screen. Um, in the extrinsic pathway, we have tissue factor and uh, factor 7 coming together to form a complex which will, uh, when activated, cause factor 10 to uh, activate to factor 10A, which becomes part of the prothrombinase complex with the assistance of factor 5A, which is activated, uh, can uh, further activate factor 2 to factor 2A from prothrombin to thrombin, which will uh, activate fibrinogen into fibrin, which can uh, further crosslink into the insoluble crosslink fibrin clot. The intrinsic pathway does not require the activation by a intrinsic factor. High molecular weight kininogen and precalacrine can activate factor 12 into factor 12A, which will then activate factor 11 into factor 11A with the help of uh, activated thrombin. Factor 9 will be activated by factor 9A as a result of the activated factor 11 with the assistance of uh, calcium. And the uh, factor 8A will uh, also be activated by thrombin and will help generate factor 10 into factor 10A by activation by factor 9. If that's confusing, you can see that this diagram is not entirely straightforward. Just walk your way through it a couple of times and see what activates what. And it'll start to make sense when you have the extrinsic pathway with tissue factor generating the tissue factor and 7A complex and walk your way through the final common pathways of activated factor 10, activating factor 2, which is thrombin, uh, and then down to fibrin and the cross-linked fibrin clot. If you do that a couple of times, it'll start to make a little bit more schematic sense to you. 
Most of the clotting factors that are made are produced in the liver, except for factor VIII, which is secreted by endothelium. Uh, factor VIII is bound and stabilized by a von Willebrand factor in the circulation, which becomes important in the setting of deficient von Willebrand factor. If you remember, factors 2, 7, 9, and 10 are vitamin K dependent uh, clotting factors, which is uh, the pharmacologic basis for the use of warfarin, which is a vitamin K inhibitor, which then directly inhibits the activation in the production of factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. The natural anticoagulants to keep this process in check are uh, antithrombin and protein C and S. Antithrombin binds and inactivates factor 2, factor 9, and factor 10. So as those key regulatory points are inactivated by antithrombin, it keeps the clotting cascade from proceeding out of control. There is a circulating enzyme plasmin which cleaves the fibrin polymers and is activated by tissue plasminogen activator, TPA, which also has pharmacologic and therapeutic significance as a clot buster. Proteins C and S are also vitamin K dependent factors and they cleave and inactivate factors 5 and factor 8. We use these uh, uh, natural anticoagulants in some of our pharmacologic anticoagulants. Heparin stabilizes the antithrombin clotting factor complex, thus increasing the activity of antithrombin many fold. And as I talked about earlier, Coumadin inhibits the vitamin K dependent factors of factor 2, 7, 9, and 10. It's important to remember that uh, the proteins C and S are also vitamin K dependent clotting factors. Uh, when you consider using a warfarin as a therapeutic measure alone. The prothrombin time and the partial thromboplastin time are the two labs that we use to measure the activity of the clotting cascade. So the prothrombin time measures uh, the function of the tissue factor pathway, especially the activity of factors 7 and 10, which are the key components of the extrinsic pathway. The prothrombin time is elevated in liver disease and warfarin therapy. The partial thromboplastin time uh, measures function of the intrinsic and common pathways, specifically factors 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. The PTT is elevated in heparin therapy as well as hemophilia. So a, a question to approach uh, after doing an examination of the normal clotting cascade. A 35-year-old gentleman has chronic hepatitis C with elevated liver enzymes and a total bilirubin of 7.6, a direct bilirubin of 5.8, and an alkaline phosphatase of 75. Which of the following lab tests is most likely to be abnormal? Well, we just discussed uh, the different uh, laboratory numbers that can be elevated in the setting of warfarin therapy and liver disease. So the correct answer here is the prothrombin time. That concludes our discussion of normal hemostasis. We'll proceed with bleeding disorders and uh, thrombocytopenia in the next section.